Alex, thank you so much for, for coming by. You're going to do a demo. You're going to talk am. to us about your book. That's I am. incredible. I, I am. How are things? How are you? Good. Yes. <laughs> Good. I've never been asked that, actually, in a setting like this. How are you? I like to start off easy. Yeah, but I it had, seems like I, because you've never been asked that, I started off really hard. I apologize. Yeah, we hit the ground running. And I mean, I had therapy today, so I don't know. <laughs> You immediately had a flashback. You want to be on a couch, get ready to talk oh, yeah. about. Yeah. I was right in my childhood, just in the thick of it, you know? I'll, I'll pull some analysis on you in a, in, okay. a, in a later way, in a much more subtle way. All right. Uh, let's talk about the book, The Home Cook. These yes. are really recipes that everybody should know inside their house. So they're not really elaborate recipes, right? They're the kind of recipes that you should just know when you're cooking for family and friends. I, I, <clears throat> um, as a chef, I just like to say we assume everybody knows everything when we cook, which is part of why it's hard for a chef to reach an audience of people that are home cooks. It's sort of a different breed of animal, like a house cat and a cheetah. You know, it's just not quite the same. Um, but this really comes from um, the fact that my mother has a collection of literally thousands of cookbooks. And she also has, um, I think about 20 years of gourmet magazine in binders. So we would eat a pie, and she'd say, is this better than the one from five years ago, November? <laughs> so there's a real pathology that began early for me. I, I was a chopped judge starting at the age of five and, and without realizing is, it. This is because your mother, right? She's, a, she's an editor of, uh, of food books and, and food magazines, right? Yes, very much so. So, But despite this huge collection, she, uh, she has this stack in the kitchen. There they make the cut. And these 10 or 12 books are like, we're in the show. <laughs> and the rest of the books are in the other rooms. So I thought, you know, she's always, when I say, she says we're having cornbread, she goes to the book, thumbs through. My mother still follows a recipe religiously. Um, and I'm a big fan of recipes. And that's the home cook soul inside of me. I think chef's eyeball, we do a pinch of this, a pinch of that. I love a recipe. I love to open a book and follow a recipe. Do I make it all the way to the end? Of the recipe, word for word? No. Um, and I have people say stuff to me, like, I made your pork chop and apple recipe, and I subbed steak for the pork chops and scallions for the apples. It was delicious. Is and I'm like, good. Is that right. almost a better compliment than someone saying that they followed your recipe to the T? Because you're also kind of teaching them how to improvise in the kitchen a little bit. They feel comfortable with your recipe. That sounds so good. I'm going to go with yes. You like that? You like that? Take um, a little, give a little spin for you. No, no, it's true. I feel like if you want to channel my voice, whether you're reading it or hearing it or whatever, yeah, you, they brought me into their kitchen with them. I'll take that. Um, but this is the sort of combination of all the books my mom has in a stack on the counter. This is a counter book I'm hoping people will just kind of flip through. And even if it's a recipe you've made many times, maybe there's one little thing about it that's, that you don't do or that you do differently, and that'll be enough exploration for you, and then you end up with dishes that you eat like an animal in the private, you know, in the private moment in your kitchen when we all eat, when we all pick the whole top off the mac and cheese and eat it and then rebake it with a new layer. I do stuff like that. I take the best muffin for myself. I slice the ends off the pork roast and I eat them. I'm oh, it fell and I just like trimmed what was mine. Um, so I think the idea behind this is you could kind of flip to it and make anything. And there are some recipes that are long, mm -hmm. you know, that you need several glasses of wine to get through. And then there's some that are this long that you can just kind of, or maybe you say, how do I cook that rice? Yeah. I feel like every Thanksgiving, everybody forgets how to make Thanksgiving dinner. 364 days go by and everybody forgets everything. I get the same questions. I feel like from the same people every year. <laughs> how, what do I do with the turkey? I'm having a meltdown. It's five hours before, and the turkey's 600 pounds. What do I do? <laughs> and there's never a relaxed scenario like, hey, so I have this turkey. I'm all ready. I have everything I need. People write stuff like, I didn't get a turkey. I have this chicken. Do you think anybody will notice? You know, these are the kinds of questions. So I think if you had a book that was kind of like, you know, like half calming aromatherapy oil and half familiar Americana, that you just might use it. 
Well, it's interesting that you say chefs assume that everybody knows the, the, same, the same amount, which isn't true. And then you talk about these small recipes. How often do you find that even some of the most basic things that you think people know how to cook well, they need to be taught? Like, I always think about eggs and scrambled eggs. And, oh. you know, I love amazing scrambled eggs, but I also didn't learn how to make amazing scrambled eggs. So I think I was like 23 years old. Someone was like, no, you got to do it this way. And I was like, oh, that's scrambled eggs. I had no idea. Yeah, I mean, I think I people say, I've told you this story before or not. Do you have friends that tell you the same 10 stories like 50 times? Yeah, you know we all do. By the way, I do it. I might repeat something I've already said <laughs> coming up. But I feel, um, why do we repeat things? I think it's because they're either something we're going over in our mind and we're reworking and rethinking, or we just love it and we want to think about the good stuff. Um, so why not have a cookbook that takes you back to a place you know and goes through the things you know? Um, and maybe you'll see it differently. Yeah. I think that's really, I don't think the eye of newt part where we're in 18 stores trying to buy all the ingredients. I mean, I buy cookbooks, I'll read a recipe. Well, I don't have that, so I'm not making it. I order pizza. I do it too. Yeah. We all do it. You just kind of, I really enjoy reading this cookbook while I'm eating pizza. I got takeout Chinese food. I'm eating Kung Pao chicken, and I'm reading about how to make French onion soup. I do it. What's your go-to takeout food? Um, that's a good question. I mean, like, what's my favorite, really? Yeah, like, what's your favorite, or what do you find you always go back to? I mean, I grew up in Midtown Manhattan, so takeout was something I always knew. My mother would make a souffle from scratch and bake bed bread from scratch, and have a stack of James Beard cookbooks to the ceiling, but we lived across the street from the Carnegie Deli my whole childhood. <laughs> so my favorite takeout, I mean, Carnegie Deli, 72 years, may it rest in peace. Yeah, um, my whole childhood, my entire life, I lived on the same block, and I stared out at the Carnegie Deli every morning. Um, when I go to my, see my parents now, it's, it's like a meteor hit the neighborhood. I don't see anything else. So my favorite go-to takeout, you asked, is pastrami and corned beef, beef mixed, uh, meaning one layer is pastrami. So rye, pastrami, rye, tiny bit of mustard, um, corned beef, tiny bit of mustard, chopped liver, rye. Oh yeah, I said it. I said that. That's a wonderful answer. You, you looked at me like it was going to be a bad answer, like you were going to be like Chinese. But that was a wonderfully specific answer. Yeah. <laughs> and extra pieces of rye to break it all apart and make extra little mini sandwiches with like, maybe the corned beef is better. So another little iteration on the side has more of that, more mustard dotted on. I'm really, I like food. <laughs> I, w I want to ask you a question uh, about your childhood at, at risk of sounding like your therapist earlier, sure. and I apologize for that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, your mother was a, a food book editor. and is. And, and, and is, excuse me, and, and, and loves food. And, you know, I watch shows, uh, these junior cooking shows, and I was oh, like, yeah. where do these kids learn to cook like this? Were you like that as a kid? Not remotely. <laughs> when I, did it start for you? Yeah, I didn't start cooking until I got out of college. I made um, boxed cakes box mix cakes, you know, with the oil and the water and the egg. But even then I would put melted butter instead of the oil. I had like a little elitist streak in me at all times. Um, in college, I did a, lots of lasagnas. You know, in those metal pans from the supermarket. And the first time I made it, I filled it up and it was so awesome. And I put it in on a tray in the oven. But then I pulled it out, took it off the tray and the pan buckled and bent and everything went on the floor. And I was like, okay, you want to be like that? I'm gonna be a chef <laughs> and fix every broken lasagna in the world. Um, so no, not at all. I started cooking out of college. My mom cooked so much when I was growing up that it was inevitable that it rubbed off on me. She would call me in the kitchen and I was her prep cook, but she wouldn't let me do a lot. She's a perfectionist. I love these stories. People say, I pulled up a stool next to my grandmother and we made gnocchi, not in my house. I was lucky to unwrap a loaf no of touch. bread and put <laughs> bread in the toaster for the eggs was like a big day, bonanza. Um, What's it like when you cook for her now? She's like, oh, you do it. I can't, I'm exhausted. You do it. Is she, is she picky? Does she critique or is she? Is of she... course. Yeah. The worst part is my mom will say, you're the chef now. You have all this experience. You do it. Don't do it like that. 
What parent doesn't act like that, right? Or what are you doing? I'm so glad you're making us dinner. What are you making? Oh, no. So there's that yin yang. Now, when it comes to this book, The, the Home Cook, and a yeah. lot of these recipe, recipes for people to, uh, maybe they've cooked it before, like I said, they're going to relearn it, or new recipes. What is your philosophy when it comes to ingredients in terms of the freshness of them and where to buy them and organic, quote unquote, or non organic? You know, do you. You really dig in deep, man. I like food. Um, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on this. The first thought I have is if you're cooking at home and you're making your own food, I'm so impressed. You buy whatever you want, and there's no food police. They're not going to come to your house. I'm not going to come to your house and say, excuse me, are those scallions really up to par? Do you really think that garlic looks good? My girlfriend might, so, you know. I, and I get a lot of people that write me, I know you, you know, because I am a judge on television, I find now I go to a restaurant, I take a sip of water, they lean in, how is it? <laughs> it's, it's, it's cold. Like my soul. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, so first and foremost, if, if you're cooking on your own, you're going to buy what you like anyway. And I'm all about it. I think f as far as organic foods go, I think organic foods are great. Um, they're great for the soil. They're great for us. Um, they're healthy. There are certainly a number of ingredients that require an excessive amount of pesticides to keep them going before they ever get to your table. And so if there's an opportunity to buy those things organic, um, I'm all about it. Things like strawberries and spinach that we love that go through quite the rigorous workout, the Barry's Boot Camp, shall we say, before they hit the table. I'm a fan. Um, I'm a fan of that. I love organic milk and organic eggs. Those are probably the things that I really try. If I buy them, obviously, do I buy milk or eggs? But if I buy those things, those types of um, sort of precious fruits, uh, produce, and dairy, I try to buy organic. I also really like organic chicken, but there are so many good chickens. I mean, um, free range, no um, antibiotics, no hormones. There are certainly a number of more affordable um, iterations is that I think we should try to buy and support the more we buy it. The other thing is this, more than that, I love when you go to the market and you buy what people are growing because yeah. then they can keep growing it. And also the bins on the, un on the underneath the sexy little apple piles and peach piles with rutabaga and turnips and, uh, potatoes, that's what I wish everybody would buy. Because the more thing, more varied things we buy, first of all, the better our diet, but second of all, we contribute to something I like a lot, which is biodiversity, which means we have to grow a lot of different things. Because I find even if given left to my own devices, I will get in some tizzy with corn between June and September, and it's, I literally feel myself turning into an ear of corn, and I just have to check myself with rutabaga and turnips and other stuff. So, like, let's buy a lot of different stuff. Absolutely. Very important. Eat the rainbow. Do you find, do you find that this, like, a focus on, uh, for lack of a better word, organic ingredients or, or organic produce, is not just for philosophical purposes, but also that it changes the flavor of, of meals and people should think about that? Yes. The taste is really good. I agree. I think it is about flavor. But when you're talking about asking somebody to spend double or triple yeah. and, and people can't always do that, I just, I, I would like to take a non-preachy, realistic approach and just try to get people to buy the best stuff they can when they can, as frequently as they can. Because those little purchases here and there make a big difference. And then other things, just buying varied produce and fruit to me is really important. Also, um, this ugly fruit concept, you know, that everything we buy has to be perfect. Um, you know, things like understanding that when grapefruits are really ripe, they have black marks that come out in the skin. Oh, I didn't know this. Yeah, Good and tip. that's actually the sugar coming out of the fruit as it ripens. As an example of something where you might say, that's not perfectly pink or yellow or blush, right? But it might mean something better. The film that we see on grapes and plums is naturally secreted by the fruit to protect the skin from cracking. These are things, and it looks like pesticide. So I just think a little education about what we actually see, 
I, I think we talk a lot about what we should buy and why, but also just going to the supermarket and knowing what you're looking at and why it's there. Maybe that could be the next book. Yeah, no, I'm just going to just talk my head off everywhere I go. But, you know, those are the little nuances, and they, they, you don't know it. I mean, most of my adult life, you know, the grapes, how they look, or a fig or a plum, you know. And then buying something that's not perfectly shapen, shaped but ripe. You know, I went, you know I, I've been to farms where I see, you know, apple picking, the amount of apples on the ground. Because people pick them, and, they, and they're not round, and they're not this, and they're not that. I mean, thank God for cider. And compote and jam and pies, we certainly find our way to, you know, get all, everybody, all the apples um, together. But sometimes that really crisp apple is not perfectly round and not perfectly red. Let's talk about uh, judging on uh, sure. um, Chopped. What, yeah. what was the first thing that you had to get used to being a judge of other people's food? What was the hardest thing, to, to, the hardest hurdle to clear? <laughs> Hate mail. From, from people that you kicked off the show? <laughs> sure. Really? Sure. Have you gotten that? Yes, definitely. From, from who? Oh. No, I'm just kidding. Like, what, it what was would it your, say? It was your, it was your cousin. <laughs> um, that was hard, um, just doing that. Just thinking, is this what I'm doing? You know, do, does what I've done, I question my own expertise and my own ability to do it well, um, which is why um, I often compete so much also because I like to stay uh, fresh with the process itself. I think there's no better way to be a judge of something than to actually do it as well. So being on these shows and competing, I'm reminded of how difficult it can be to do something that, that I think they should do. Well, that's obvious. He should do that. Then I compete and I say, well, that's really hard. No wonder. You know, I have to remind myself of the process. I think that's part of being a good judge. I also think part of being a good judge is... Um, if someone makes a food I don't like, I get this question a lot. What do you do when someone gives you food you don't like? I, I, I can't factor that into what's going on because it's about what they chose and how they executed it, who made the best dish. So I guess... I mean, as a chef, do you really have specific meals that you don't like? Yeah, or? I'm human. Really? Yeah. There's stuff that I've cooked for so many years in restaurants, I never want to see it again. Like what? Um, I... If, if it, I literally start to twitch when I see any form of risotto anywhere. <laughs> I start to div just a tick. I have like a risotto tick. I can smell it being cooked in this five mile radius because I cooked it in three different restaurants for six years in a row. I cooked and tasted arborio rice cooking every night for six years. I, I, can't, I just can't, I, I, I'm, getting, I'm getting worked up. This is what I talk about in therapy. I want to love rice again. Um, Lucky therapist getting paid to just be like, sure, you don't like risotto. That's yeah. Cool. yeah. Well, she's like eating rice pilaf. She's like, I got to go. Guarna Shelley's here. <laughs> she sprays the Febreze. Um, I, mussels, I de like bits dicey. I cooked them for years. I, they're so pretty. They're so great. They have no calories, no fat. They're delicious. I just can't even with them. Really? Nah, no. There's some other stuff, patty pan squash, those little squash, they make me anxious. What are they doing? <laughs> They're not doing anything. So I have stuff, yes. You have stuff that it's hard for you to, to eat. I just avoid it right. if I can. But as a judge, obviously as a chef, you know, you're telling your, the, chef, the, the cooks that work for you what, what they're doing, what works about what they're doing and what doesn't work. Sure. How do you translate that to in front of the camera? I don't think I understand your question. You mean, do I give what kind of directives do I give the contestants on the show? I'm sure relative it's one thing. To, I'm sure it's one thing to tell someone what is good or bad about what they're doing in a kitchen without cameras. But when you started doing it in front of a camera, did you feel like you had to amp yourself up a little bit or pull punches so you you didn't? Boy, come that's across a great a question. Way? No, I hope that's part of why the show's still on. I think it's probably one and the same. Right. Uh, you know, the this uh, also. You know, you can talk for five minutes and it gets edited down too. <laughs> so there's that too. Let's add that in, right? I loved your dish. It was amazing. I have something in my tooth. And then that one, you know, or... Have you ever said anything to the producers? Have you been like, guys, come on. Why yeah. You... Really? Sure. Sure. The editors of Chopped came for dinner after season two. And I was like, what would you like for dinner? <laughs> Some strychnine? <laughs> I mean, I'm kidding. Kind of. Not really. Sure. I mean, editing is a big thing. 
you can, you can imagine. And by the way, anything you say on television, I mean, it is fair game, right? You said it, it's part of, it represents who you are. But, you know, the editing process can change things a little bit. Um, and I did find that um, that affected what people thought. By the way, sometimes there's people that come on the show and they're like, oh, I don't know, I don't really care. And that just gets me, my blood pressure starts to, you know, like when a cook shows up 45 minutes late for their shift and isn't set up and doesn't seem to care. It's the same as someone who voluntarily, I want to remind everybody, I say this to the contestants, Chopped is voluntary. You came here today to win money and maybe learn something about yourself. And what I've discovered is the show's been on for so many years that it, it has become sort of like a spa for the senses for a lot of chefs who, um, you know, learn something about themselves. I mean, only 25% of the people that go on Chopped win. Yeah. And I, I often say, please, I hope there are other reasons you came here today. And I hope you get a lot out of it. The hope is that everybody gets something out of it. And it's amazing what happens to people. And it's amazing how much I've learned about food, ingredients. I mean, I've learned it along with America. And it's, I mean, it's kind of amazing. I said no to the first episode. I declined to be on the pilot of Chopped. Why is that? I didn't, I didn't like the idea, so I said I was busy. And they sent me the pilot, and they said, we really feel like you should be part of the cast of this show. Um, and I just said, I have to wash my hair. Really? <laughs> I'm booked. I have pork chops to cook. And, um, so they really um, pursued me, and I'm, <laughs> I'm really glad they did, because they were right. The Food Network, that is. You said the editors came to dinner. Did they come to dinner at Butter, your restaurant? Yeah. What's it like still having a restaurant in the midst of being so incredibly busy? Do you still feel like you can be as attentive to the recipes and no. the specials that you want to be? No. I mean, I, I'd love to say I can do it all. I can't. Um, but I only have one restaurant, and that's part of why I only have one. Um, I don't think I've got a, you know, I've got a bunch of restaurants in me. There are definitely products and things I want to explore making, um, but Butter is an amazing restaurant. It's been around for 16 years, and the staff is a family. How long have you been there? Uh, 15 years. I actually read the review of Butter in the New York Times before I had ever gone and thought, I better get to that place before it closes because <laughs> it just sounded great, but maybe I felt it sort of had a lot of... You know, chicken steamed in banana leaves with sesame oil and Parmigiano Reggiano. Just felt a little confused. Um, and I ate there, and the food was delicious. And the staff was amazing. And they said, do you want to be the chef? And I just thought, I don't think I can say no. Um, <clears throat> there was a gentleman in the kitchen cooking scallops. And I walked into the kitchen, and he um, was holding the pan with one hand, and he was searing, putting the scallops in the pan, and he was smiling, I mean, almost like a geisha-like smile. And I've, I've said this before, I felt that the hum of the pan and the heat and the handle was traveling up through his heart and to his mouth and into his brain and making him smile. So I looked at this person, and I just thought, yeah, I gotta take this job, because that person's really into this. And he still works with me to this day. Wow. Yeah, all these years later. And so do a number of other people. He's still in the kitchen at Butter? Yep, yep. 16 years later. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, it, it is, it's, it's, it's an incredible thing, a restaurant. A lot of what a restaurant is, is is a group of people that make an agreement with one another every day that they're going to pull together and make it work. Um, I'd love to say it's all about the chef, but I think it's the sensibility of the chef and certainly the philosophy that hopefully sets a tone that works. And that's been my plan. Now, before I let you go, I, I saw a clip <laughs> recently. I don't know if the clip was recent of you on uh, Seth Meyers cooking, oh, yeah. him, cooking him a cheeseburger, which he was freaking out about, and you being hilarious on, on set with him, oh, holding yeah. your own against the comedian. What was that like? First of all, Seth is so smart. He's super intimidating because he's funny and he's smart. Obviously, I, I mean, they often go hand in hand. But he was so warm and welcoming, and I was so nervous. But he said, I've been on a diet for a week, and my wife is going to kill me for eating this cheeseburger, and it's all I've been thinking about all day. So I ha was lucky enough 
to um, have him in a good position where I was making something he really wanted to eat. Yeah. Um, but, oh, my God, when he said, I don't know if any of you saw it, but he hunkered down to eat the burger, and he said to me, hold my tie. <laughs> so I held his tie, and he took, I mean, you know, they say on TV, take ladylike bites. He took a bite. He took a real bite. Like it was his last cheeseburger ever and was so happy. I love that food can do that. A cheeseburger is an amazing yeah. thing. Yeah. No one should ever underestimate the power of a cheeseburger. Oh, yeah. And as you get older, you can't eat them as much, so they just get says more you. powerful. Well, it says me, I, 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 you know, they, they put me to bed. I can't eat a cheeseburger all the time. But when I do eat one, I do what Seth did in that video, which is, ah, oh, like it pulls me away. Yeah, well, this was a double cheeseburger, and it took me a long time to assemble it. And he was like, hurry up. And I had these vegetable <laughs> chips on the counter. And he said, what are those? And I said, vegetable chips. And he said, ah. Oh. <laughs> he was so great. So that was super fun. That was a few months ago. With fried onions on it, right? Or onions? Yeah. And it had onions? Us, you know, a couple sauces and cheese. And it was, I wanted to eat it. It was hard to assemble it and not. You know, you ever make something and not want to give it to anybody? <laughs> I've baked brownies before, cut them up, and just been like, you know what? I'm not actually going to give these. Can't make it tonight. Sorry, guys. Yeah, or I just go to a bakery and buy a cake and I eat the brownies I made. Just kind of sad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Alex, the book is on shelves right now, right? No. People, no? Oh, excuse me. It comes out in September. Oh. Uh, you can pre-order it if you like. Pre-order the book. Yes. Pre-order the book. Yes. This is me making up for saying that it's on shelves right now. Pre-order the book, guys. Alex, uh, I can't wait to see your demo. Thank you so much for being here. Of it's course. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Alex Shelley, everybody. Thank you, Alex. Of course.